All right, thank you very much, John. Uh, it is my very distinct pleasure to be invited to speak to you all here today. Um, the last two years have been a very interesting time to be alive, uh, but it's also been a very good time to be in Perth. It's been a very safe place to live. It has definitely highlighted how far away we are from the rest of the world. But it has also highlighted, to me at least, how much that doesn't matter. When I sat down to write this keynote, it occurred to me that this probably shouldn't have come as a surprise to me because so much of my career has been predicated on exactly that premise. That in this modern era, uh, you, as long as you've got a moderately stable internet connection, you can live almost anywhere and have an immense impact on the world as a whole. I won't deny that geography introduces complications, but they can be overcome. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. How anyone in this room can have an impact on the entire world, despite the fact that you live in an isolated city like Perth. But who am I anyway? Well, I am a sand groper, born and bred. Uh, all my schooling was in Perth, up to and including a PhD at Curtin. Uh, I started my PhD in 1998. Uh, when I was about two thirds of the way through, my supervisor and I came to a mutual understanding that my future did not lie in academia. She identified quite correctly that I wanted to build things. I was in my happy place when I was writing code. And so she said she would help me get to the finish line of a PhD, but I needed to get out. The reason she was able to pick up on this was that my attention wasn't fully on my research topic. Theoretical studies of neural networks didn't really grab my attention anywhere near as much as something else that was going on. The emerging world of open source software. Linux was just starting to get traction in industry as a serious alternative. The idea of Linux on the desktop was just starting to get some buzz. The GNOME and KDE desktop environments were both pre-version 1.0. And I was getting more than a little bit distracted by those projects. Um, because they were open source, I could download them for free, compile them for my own computer, and I could then use them to develop my own projects. And I had a bunch of them. I'd constantly be tinkering with them. They never really went anywhere, but I was young, I was carefree, I had nothing but spare time to fill. And my supervisor noticed and told me to finish your GTFO. And so I wrapped up my thesis and I went out into industry. I worked away at my day job and at night I would go home, I would continue to tinker with those projects that had distracted me all the way through my PhD. Somewhere around 2005 I came to the realisation that this web thing looked like it was going to be a big deal and I should probably spend some time working out how it worked. Uh, despite having honours and a PhD in computer science and studying database theory, I'd never actually built a data-driven web page. Stacks of static HTML, sure, but nothing actually database backed. And so I started to tinker. I looked into PHP, couldn't make head or tails of it. I looked at Ruby on Rails and a bunch of other Python web-based framework or web frameworks, and none of them really stuck. And then I stumbled onto what was at the time a brand new Python web framework, Django. Now, for those who don't know it, Django is a web framework written in Python. Uh, the sales tagline is that Django is the web framework for perfectionists with deadlines. Uh, it started its life as an in-house content management system in the Lawrence Journal World, the city newspaper of Lawrence, Kansas. Lawrence is a college town, home of the University of Kansas Lawrence. Go Blue Jays. And the, Lawrence world, uh, the Journal World could see that the writing was on the wall for small town newspapers, and they needed to do something. And so they assembled a team of tech people to build a web presence for their newspaper. But they didn't just try to put the newspaper on the web. They went all in on what is now referred to as data journalism and built a set of tools to let them rapidly develop data-backed websites that would allow them to tell dynamic stories to their readers. In 2005, the lead of the development team at the Journal World, Adrian Holovati, uh, gave a five-minute lightning talk at PyCon US, uh, the big Python international conference, talking about what they built, and got absolutely swamped by people who wanted those tools, please. Now, it was an internal in-house tool, but they were able to convince newspaper management that the software they were writing wasn't the core business of a newspaper, and they might be able to get some assistance from other people to improve those tools if they open sourced them. And so they did, and in June 2005, Django was born. I heard about Django in late October of 2005. I downloaded it, went through the tutorial, and for the first time, the web made sense to me. I understood what a website was trying to do and how it did what it did. But it was also a freshly minted open source project, and it wasn't perfect by a long shot. After I did the tutorial, I turned to my pet projects and started hitting some limitations. Django could do a lot, but there were bugs in the things that it could do, and there were a lot of things it couldn't do. And so I 
decided to see how much effort would be involved in trying to fix some of those problems and limitations. I picked a particular database query that I needed for one of the projects I was working on and worked through the code to see why it wasn't working and if I could make that query work. I did, submitted a patch, and after a couple of days it was merged. Okay, that's nice. Followed it up with a couple of other contributions, and after a couple of those, Adrian Holovardi asked me if I wanted to join the core team. I joined the Django core team in early January of 2006, which was a little over two months after I'd first heard of the project. Now, I kept contributing in my spare time and adding more bug fixes, new features, reviewing contributions from other people. But then, about two months later, something really serendipitous happened. I worked out that I could use Django for my day job. My employer at the time, Calatrix Technologies, had a contract to build a data-backed client server system as a Java client against a server. And we were all ready to dig in to a 12-month multi-engineer project to build this system. But it occurred to me that what we were proposing to build was a database-backed website. We needed a central database to store data and a web interface to collect the data from multiple users. So I pitched this to my engineering manager. Um, he was skeptical but intrigued. So he went off, did the tutorial, and in the next two days built a prototype that was maybe 75% of what we needed to deliver. Um, and this was a project, remember, that we had scoped as being 12 months for multiple engineers. So the project very rapidly pivoted to become a Django project. I was writing Django code for my day job. And because it was still a young project, we hit lots of bugs, so I'd fix the bugs on company time. And realizing that there was a certain benefit in having someone in-house on the core team of the project that was a cornerstone of this new thing they were building, the company gave me a certain amount of liberty to work on other people's problems as well, keep on top of mailing lists, review bugs from other people, and so on. A couple of years later, on the basis of my reputation as a contributor to Django, I was headhunted to work at a startup called What News. Uh, what News was a data-backed data website working in, as the name suggests, news media, uh, and so Django was obviously a good match coming from a news heritage. What News eventually pivoted into the music industry, changed the name to We Are Hunted, uh, and after I left, was eventually sold to Twitter and relaunched as Twitter Music, which then shut it down about six months later. The thing that's interesting, though, is that through all of this, I didn't leave Perth. Calatrix was and is a local Perth company. What News was based in Brisbane. Uh, Stephen Phillips, the founder of What News, wanted me to move to Brisbane uh, to take up this job. But when I was reluctant, he took a punt on hiring me as a remote employee in 2008. The original plan was that I'd work one week in Brisbane, fly in on a Monday, fly out on a Friday, and then work the next three weeks from my home office. That plan lasted for about three months. Uh, my site visits got further and further apart, and after about a year, uh, I would have visit you know, somewhere in mid-year and then somewhere near the end of the year for the Christmas party, and that was it. All of my Django development was being done from my home office in Perth. All of the communication with the rest of the Django project was being done over mailing lists, over bug trackers. I didn't meet or spend any time with the rest of the core team until some time later. Django 1.0 was released in September of 2008, and I watched that release happen over IRC, sitting in a hotel room at the San Francisco Airport Hilton, and I still hadn't met a single member of the Django core team. I didn't meet anyone from the core team until the next day. I was in San Francisco to attend the very first Django conference, hosted at the Google offices at Mountain View, and that's me on stage, with five people that I had been working with on a daily basis for three years, but had not met until that morning. Django still has a very fond place in my heart, but it's not where I spend most of my open source time these days. These days, I have a collection of projects that I manage under the umbrella of the Beware project. Beware is attempting to do to native applications what Django did for websites, to provide tools to make it easy to churn out native applications in Python for your laptop, for your phone, or for your tablet. Beware is still a work in progress. It's very much like Django in the early days. And it is, at this point, something I do entirely in my spare time. I haven't worked out how to make it my day job yet. I am trying. But it does have practical uses. This slide deck is being presented using Podium, which is a presentation tool written entirely in Python using the Beware suite. The Beware core team is spread all over the world, and most of them I have never met in person. All right, so that's my story. Why should you care? Well, through that entire story, three things have been true. Firstly, I have not had to leave Perth to have any of these experiences. By choice, I do go to a lot of conferences. That's partially because I enjoy public speaking. Plus, I also get to make Florence, a trip to Florence a tax write-off, which, you know, isn't too bad. Um, but conferences aren't a required part of the contribution process. Due to everything, uh, this is the first time I have spoken on stage in over two years. 
um, but my open source contributions, they've just kept ticking on. In many respects, the last two years for me have been a lot more like the first few years of my open source career. No travel, just contributions. Uh, the core of my open source reputation was built from my home office, over email, over bug trackers, without any face-to-face -face contact with anyone else on the projects that I was contributing to. And in terms of the work environment, for all of the chaos that COVID has wrought on the world, it is now easier than ever to convince employers to hire remote employees because they have been forced to accept that, yeah, offices aren't magic and it actually works pretty well having remote employees. Secondly, while I have done a lot of open source work, at no point has open source been my day job. I have never been paid to work on Django. I've definitely answered Django mailing list questions on company time and fixed bugs and reviewed code that wasn't directly related to business uh, and business goals. But I've never had open source developer as my job title. I've never worked at a company whose product was open source. And lastly, pretty much all of the career opportunities I have had over the last 16 years have come as a direct result of my open source contribution. I have been headhunted by multiple companies, none of them based in Perth, because of my reputation in open source. I have been sought as a contractor and consultant because of my reputation in open source. I have run my own startup using the experience that I gained as an open source maintainer. Every job interview that I have gone into, I have already been known to the people who are interviewing me. Now, I can't lie, I have been extraordinarily lucky. When I sat down 16 years ago to contribute to Django, I absolutely won the lottery. I picked by chance a project that turned into an absolute rocket ship. It is a rare project that spawns multiple international conferences and becomes the cornerstone of a startup ecosystem. I am also very fortunate to have good health, to speak English, to be hetero, cis male. I am playing the game of life on easy settings. I also have a very understanding and supportive wife who doesn't mind when I disappear into my office for hours on a weekend to tinker on something. Or at least I don't think she minds. But you can, to an extent, make your own luck. And contributing to open source is a great way to make that luck. Think for a moment about what is involved in contributing to an open source software project. If you are contributing, you are, by definition, working with a team of people. You won't have authority over any of them. So you'll need to convince them that your design for a new feature is the right design or the approach you're taking is the right approach. That almost certainly involves some form of technical communication. Most projects will expect contributors to review the work of others. That often requires some level of mentoring and contributions won't always come from highly experienced developers. It's often necessary to guide a new contributor towards the standards and practices of a specific project or teach them entirely new ideas that they should, they should incorporate into their contributions. There is the obvious bread and butter of software engineering, designing and developing new software, software that will be extensively reviewed by a network of peers who will be extremely technical, criti technically critical of any possible flaws in a design that you propose, because their usage of this project will be directly impacted by your suggested changes. You will also likely need to debug problems that have been reported by others, working anywhere from first tier technical support where the bug reports are incoherent, but might indicate a problem, all the way through through diagnosis of some well-specified but very, very deep technical problem. Now, if I was to strike out the words open source from that list and replace it with literally any other software project, does that list of skills change? No, what I've described are the attributes of any well-rounded technical contributor. Involvement in open source is amazing career practice. More importantly, it is career practice you can have in the open, in places you can point to a public record of your activities. If I want to prove that I can design big systems, I can point at any number of Django's tentpole features. If I want to prove I can communicate technical ideas, I can point at volumes of mailing list archives. The evidence of my skill is in the open for everyone to see. You don't need to be hired to get this experience either. Open source projects are, by and large, driven by volunteers. And unless a volunteer is making a real nuisance of themselves, it's a very rare project that will turn away a volunteer. No matter your level of experience, you can almost certainly find something to do where you can contribute and build on that experience over time. And if you play your cards right, you can develop this experience and reputation on the clock at your current employer. I certainly did and do my share of open source contribution in my spare time on a volunteer basis, but I've also spent plenty of my employer's time developing my public reputation. And none of it requires you to be anywhere in particular. As long as you can write an email, respond to things on GitHub, you can participate in discussions. 
So the real question becomes, could you replicate the success that I have had? And I firmly believe the answer is yes. If you make a concerted effort to involve yourself in open source as a community, you will see